In the last video, we looked at the reasons why particles would be globbed together as a solid or as a liquid. In other words, what are the intermolecular forces, the forces that cause molecular substances to stick molecule to molecule together in a group? Today, we're going to look at the general properties that are exhibited on a macroscopic scale by substances when they're liquids or solids and kind of contrast that with what we saw with gases. And then we're going to look at some phenomena that are related to changes in phase, changes from solid to liquid or liquid to gas and so on. So let's get started talking about some general properties of solids and liquids. There's some of these properties are dependent on how tight the particles are packed together. In other words, in solids and liquids, the particles are so close to one another that they're limited in what they can do to respond to outside forces. And one of these properties is incompressibility. Solids and liquids compared with gases are relatively incompressible. So if we remember Boyle's law, Boyle's law said that as you increase the pressure on a gas, the volume will decrease pretty dramatically. With solids and liquids, however, if you were to draw the same graph, you'd find out that the line is pretty much flat. I mean, it might, they're compressible a little bit, but not very much. So this is solids and liquids compared with gases, which compress dramatically. An example of where this comes into practical play is in brake fluid. Our cars these days almost all operate by hydraulically actuated brakes. And so you push down on the brake pedal, and it pushes a fluid and that fluid moves through the lines and actuates the brakes, like this. So here we see this woman depressing the brakes. That forces fluid down these lines because the fluid is incompressible. That pushes on the brake pads, which rub on this disc, and that stops the car. Now in that example that we just saw with brake fluid, if her brake lines had been filled with air rather than with a liquid, the air would simply have compressed, and she never would have been able to stop her car. In fact, this used to be a fairly common problem that would arise in brake lines. A little hole would rust through the brake line, fluid would leak out and be replaced with air, and then you'd go to push on your brakes and this big bubble of gas would just compress and your brakes would not actuate. You can see another example of this by looking at gas and water in a syringe and how they respond to force. Here you can see I have a plastic syringe. There's a cap nearby, but it's not on. I'm drawing some liquid, water in this case, into the syringe from a beaker. When I put the cap on, I've got an incompressible fluid captured in this syringe. Now watch what happens as I push. I'm pushing pretty hard on this plunger, and I am not able to make it go down. This is like the brake fluid in a brake system. I'm unable to compress the liquid water. Now I'm taking the cap off and I'll pull back on the plunger. This allows air to enter the system and with air in the system by pushing down on the plunger I'm able to get it to compress pretty readily. Gases compress, liquids and solids don't. Another thing that difference, that's different between solids, liquids, and gases is how they diffuse through one another. The rates of diffusion for solids and liquids are much lower than they are for gases. Here's an example. Looking at three substances, if I had a bottle of perfume or something else that smelled like ammonia or something like that, and I took the lid off of it, individual gas particles would evaporate out of there, and they would make their way through air. And as you can see here, the pathway that they take involves not very much collision. So they can move in long straight lines to where they're ever, wherever they're going. So they can move at whatever their normal speed is. And we know from studying gases that that can be quite rapid, even at room temperature. So if you walk past somebody's locker and they just sprayed perfume all over the place, it doesn't take very long before that it diffuses all over the hallway and it smells in places of the room where the perfume wasn't originally sprayed. Liquids, by contrast, if you had a particle of honey, for example, in a teacup, in order to get around in the teacup, that honey has got to move around and bounce off of particles that are packed closely together. And so that takes it a quite a bit more time. So we stir it to help it along, but if we didn't, you know, it would take a very long time, probably a matter of days, for the honey to actually sweeten the entire cup of tea. For solids, of course, you might think it's virtually impossible for them to diffuse through one another. Like if we had a block of copper, for example, and a block of aluminum you could clamp them in a vise for a really, really long time and there would be virtually no 
diffusion. Eventually, they would diffuse into one another. The particles would migrate into one another, but uh, only under high pressure and very, very slowly. And that has to do with the tightness of packing that's in solids and liquids compared with gases. Another contrast you see in general properties is that of shape and volume. Gases expand to fill the shape of their container. They don't retain their shape, nor do they retain their volume. Liquids will retain their volume. They have strong enough intermolecular forces at room temperature that they can hold themselves together in a specific volume. But if you put them in different containers, they'll take the shape of that container because they can't counteract the force of gravity that pulls them t towards the boundaries of that container. Solids, however, have strong enough intermolecular forces that they retain their shape and their volume at room temperature. Now, of course, all of these things are just at a given temperature. You can make any gas turn into a liquid. You can make any liquid turn into a solid, and you can make any solid melt into a liquid or a gas. But at a fixed temperature and pressure, the property of shape and volume retention for gases, liquids, and solids depends on the strength of the intermolecular forces. Weak IMFs probably mean that the particles will escape from one another and become a gas. Stronger IMFs will mean liquid retention, but not shape unless the IMFs are very strong, in which case they can retain their shape even when there's an attempt to distort them by a container. Another property that exists for liquids but not for gases is something called surface tension. Surface tension essentially is a net attraction that all the molecules in a liquid have toward the center of mass. Another word for this is cohesion. Here's how it works. If we imagine these particles all being attracted to each other by some IMF, like let's say there's, these are water molecules, then that intermolecular force would be hydrogen bonding. So a particle in the middle here is attracted pretty much equally all around by the neighboring particles intermolecular attractions. If I contrast that with a particle that's on the surface, like this one here, it also is attracted to the neighboring particles through the same intermolecular forces. But there's a difference, isn't there? On the outside, out here, there is nothing to attract that particle. So the particles on the outside end up experiencing a net inward pull because there's no balancing pull that pulls them towards the outside. So this is why particles of water form droplets. Another example is filling a water glass up above the rim. You've probably done this before. That phenomenon exists because of surface tension. You can see I've got a glass here, a shot glass, and I'm pouring some water in there from a beaker. So it's getting fuller. And as it gets really close to full here, I'm going to switch my angle and take a closer look at the very top of this glass pretty full right now, but I'm going to take my beaker and continue to add even more water. Because of surface tension right up here at the top, I'm able to fill this fuller than actually full. Surface tension is like a skin. Liquids also exhibit surface wetting. When you put liquids on surfaces, if they're attracted to particles that are within the surface, like water molecules are attracted to glass molecules, for example, they will spread out and wet that surface. This is a property that's sometimes called adhesion. An example would be water on wax surfaces. Like if I have two ski bases and one is well waxed and the other one doesn't have so much wax on it, I can definitely see the difference between how well the water wets. Here I have a part of a ski base that isn't very well waxed. I've used some base cleaner to remove the wax. I put a couple of drops of water on there and as I move the water around with the tip of my pipette, you can see that it separates into two droplets, and I can get it to spread out a little bit on this base. Now, the plastic the base is made of is not very attractive to water, and so it doesn't wet really well. But here's another part of the ski base for comparison. This is a well-waxed part of the base. When I put a couple drops of water on there and start to play around with it using the tip of my pipette, it responds quite a bit differently. The water droplet stays together, it's cohesive, it's not attractive at all to the base surface, and so it sticks together with the other water. That's strong cohesion, poor adhesion. The other place had slightly better adhesion, and so we say that it wet the ski a little bit better. Surface acting agents 
or surfactants, for short, are things that act on the surface tension and break it up. And that will increase the ability of a substance to wet. Detergents are a good example of that. Here I've got my overfull glass of water, and I've brought in a beaker here that has some diluted dish, dish detergent, which is a surfactant, of course. And I'm getting a pipette full of it. And uh, then we're going to change the view and take a close up look at the surface tension that's holding the water in over the top of the glass. And watch what happens when I add a single drop of that detergent. It starts to drip over the side there and again here. Drops of detergent increase the ability of water to penetrate into close spaces and increase the ability to wash clothes, for example, because the water's surface tension would normally not allow the water to get in between the fabric fibers but a surfactant breaks it up and allows that to happen. Now let's talk about changes of state. Some of the words that I'm going to use here are very familiar to you and you've seen them before. I'm first going to put in here some changes that are endothermic. In other words, changes that require energy. When a liquid becomes a gas, we call that process vaporization. And that's endothermic. You have to add energy to turn a liquid into a gas. We know that. That's common sense because you have to boil water on the stove. It doesn't just happen at room temperature. When a solid turns into a liquid, that's called melting, of course, and that requires energy as well. If you have a block of ice and you want it to melt, you've got to bring it in where it's warm. When a solid becomes a gas, this is probably less familiar, that process is called sublimation. Solid goes directly to a gas. This happens with some common substances. Um, dry ice is carbon dioxide in the solid state. And at normal atmospheric pressure, it never actually goes into the liquid state. It goes directly from solid to gas. But that's an endothermic process. That happens only when it's warm enough to give energy to the solid and cause it to become a gas. Now let's look at some processes that are exothermic. When a gas becomes a liquid, that's called condensation. And condensation, you probably have noticed in the summer, happens around things that are cold, like a cold glass of water sitting out on the counter. Condensation appears on the outside of it. Why does it happen where it's cold? Because it's an exothermic process, and it's going to occur in places where the energy can be absorbed by something cold, because it's releasing energy when it condenses. A liquid changing into a solid is called freezing. And freezing is also an exothermic process. We don't normally think about freezing as being exothermic. It's sort of counterintuitive because freezing happens when it's cold and you don't think about giving off heat as happening where it's cold. But in fact, that's where freezing has to happen because there has to be something in the environment to absorb the energy that's being given off. Another way you can sort of verify this is stick your hand back behind the freezer. It's hot back there. And the reason is because it's taking energy out of the things that are being frozen inside and putting it into the atmosphere. And when a gas becomes a solid, that has the same name as when a gas becomes a liquid, and that's just called condensation. Condensation is used in birth, both cases because what it's doing is it's condensing or making more dense the particles in a gas. In a gas, they're spread apart. In a liquid, they're packed closely together. In a solid, they're packed even more closely together in most cases. Evaporation is an endothermic process. It's vaporization that happens very slowly. We're going to take a look at energy and evaporation. And what we're going to use is something called a frequency diagram. On the y-axis here, we're plotting how many particles exist. And then on the x-axis, we're plotting kinetic energy. So what we're actually doing is making a sort of a graph of how many particles have what kinetic energy. And people who have researched this and even theoretically looked at it have shown that in a typical situation, this is sort of what you've got. There are no particles that have no kinetic energy, or very few that have no kinetic energy, only the ones that have come to a stop during a collision. And few particles have really, really high kinetic energy. Most particles are somewhere in the middle. And the top of this hump would be the average KE, 
course, kinetic energy is related to temperature. So this is sort of related to, to how hot it is. Now, in order for a particle to evaporate, if you look at the surface, you've got all these liquid particles at that surface. If evaporation is going to occur, one of those particles has got to make a break for it. It's got to escape. And that means it has to break the intermolecular forces that are holding it to the other particles nearby. So there's a certain minimum amount of kinetic energy it has to have for it, as it's jiggling around here, to pop out of there and, and escape and become gaseous. We can plot that on this kinetic energy diagram. So this is what I'm going to call Ke minimum. It's the minimum escape kinetic energy that's needed. And that's going to be different depending on the intermolecular forces for every particle. But let's say we've got water or acetone or any substance. It's going to have a minimum amount of kinetic energy based on its IMFs. Now, the particles that can leave are only the ones that have at least the minimum kinetic energy. So I'm shading in the part of the diagram that represents how many particles are going to evaporate. Now, evaporation causes the average temperature of the liquid to drop. And here's why. The particles that are leaving during evaporation are the ones that have the highest kinetic energy. So when they're gone, what's left is all the rest of these particles back here that have less kinetic energy than the top ones. That means the average kinetic energy actually shifts down. The temperature drops when evaporation occurs. Don't believe me? Lick the back of your hand and blow on it. Go ahead, do it. Feels cool, doesn't it? Your hand has to give energy to those particles to make up for the lost kinetic energy when the particles evaporated, when you blew on it. Let's compare the evaporation of two different liquids. So let's assume that we're starting out with a frequency diagram that looks like this. If I have a substance that has a very high intermolecular forces, it's Ke min for that substance, um, high, let's say, so this is high intermolecular forces, is going to be up here somewhere. Now let's look at a different substance that has a lower escape kinetic energy. So its Ke min is down here. This is because it has low intermolecular forces, so it just doesn't take as much energy for a particle to escape. If I shade in the area that represents how many particles can escape from that low IMF substance, I see that the area is bigger. So what that means is when liquids with different intermolecular forces evaporate at the same temperature, in other words, with the same frequency diagram that we see here, the one that has the weakest intermolecular forces evaporates most readily. Look at this example. Acetone versus water versus motor oil. Motor oil has very high IMFs because it has lots of London forces. Water has pretty high intermolecular forces because it does hydrogen bonding. And acetone has just simple dipole-dipole interactions. Watch the relative rates of evaporation. So I've got a bottle of acetone here, and I put an A on my desk for a drop of that. And then I've got a beaker uh, filled with water, just ordinary water, pipette in there. I can use some of that. And then we're going to use some 40-weight motor oil as our third experimental substance. So I'll take a drop of my acetone, and I'm going to put it right underneath the A. I'm actually going to use two or three drops so I get a good-sized puddle. And we zoom back a little bit. You can barely make up the little puddle. It blends in pretty well. We're starting this little demonstration out at 12.49 p.m., just for reference. Now I'm going to take a pipette full of water and put about the same size of a puddle, about the same amount of water, under the W for water on my desk. And we'll start letting that evaporate. And then under the M for motor oil, I'm going to put a puddle of motor oil with a pipette. And now we'll just watch and see what happens. Well, it's 12.52. Three minutes have elapsed since we started evaporating. And the acetone is dry. When I sweep my finger through, I can feel that it's dry. There's a little divot in the table. It looks like it interacted with the table surface. 22 minutes have now elapsed. It's 1.11 p.m. And when I test the water surface by sweeping my finger through it, I find that it's completely dry. It's all evaporated after that amount of time. It's 2.38. It's been an hour and 48 minutes. Let's check on the motor oil. Still looks to be there. 
high intermolecular forces, so it's evaporating more slowly. Let's wait a little longer. Now it's 4.43. Three hours and 50 more, four minutes have elapsed. Check on the motor oil again. Well, it's still there. I sweep my finger through it, and I see that it's still wet. Another factor is temperature. Higher temperatures are going to result in faster evaporation. Here's why. Assume that we're starting out with this frequency diagram that we've seen before. So let's say this is the low temperature. Now, we're going to have the same number of particles, but we're going to draw a new frequency diagram. And this will be a frequency diagram for a higher temperature. Well, we're still going to have some particles down here at zero kinetic energy, the ones that are in mid-collision. But now our average temperature has shifted, and it's not here anymore. It's maybe up here. Since we have the same area under the curve, which means the same number of particles, but our average has shifted up, here's what has to happen to the frequency diagram. It has to get a little bit flatter and squatter. Now, what's the effect? If I install my Ke min for whatever this substance is right here, remember this is the minimum amount of energy it has to have for a particle to evaporate. At the low temperature, this is the area that's rep that represents the particles that can escape. At the higher temperature, I can see the area under the curve that's higher than Ke min is much bigger. And so a larger fraction of the particles have enough energy to escape. At the higher temperature, the liquid will evaporate more rapidly. Here I have a glass plate. I've written the current temperature. It's kind of cold in my office, 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And I put a few drops of acetone on there. And we're going to put a clock here and sort of watch it, the time as it evaporates. So it's 1.15 now. And we'll kind of keep track of it as it evaporates. Well, it's, I got a little bit distracted, and it's it's 1.30, and it's all evaporated. You can see a little stain on the plate, but the liquid's all gone. It was gone long before the 15 minutes that have elapsed, but uh, it took a little while. Now I'm replacing the 65-degree Fahrenheit plate with a plate that I just took out of the oven. So this is at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I'm going to take about the same amount of acetone and add it to this plate, and we're going to watch the clock. It's at 2.34.51 right now, that's when it started, and we're going to see how long it takes to evaporate. If you're looking at the plate, um, the refresh rate on this webcam that I'm using is slow enough that you can actually visualize, you can actually see the acetone disappearing from the plate. Let's skip a little time here, speed this up. Now here we are with 38 seconds elapsed and the plate is completely dry. There's no liquid left on there at all. Evaporated faster. With solids and liquids, we get our first look at this idea of dynamic equilibrium. And this is going to occupy a lot of what we're going to do for the remainder of the year here in AP Chemistry. It's the idea that there's change taking place. In this case, it's physical change that we're talking about. But in the future, it will be chemical change. But even though change is taking place, there's no net change in either of the phases. So what that means is the process can reach a point where it's going both directions at the same rate. An example of this would be evaporation of a liquid in a sealed container. So on the left-hand side here, you see a flask. It's got a stopper in it, and there's some water or some liquid in the bottom, and it's beginning to evaporate. And this kind of molecular level picture here is showing us what happens at the surface of the liquid during evaporation. Particles that once were part of the liquid are breaking the IMFs that hold them in place and escaping the liquid cluster and finding themselves up in the space above the liquid as individual gas particles. On the right hand side we see the same picture only we will notice that the number of arrows going up into the headspace is the same as the number of arrows going down into the liquid. So this is a process that's reached dynamic equilibrium. The number of particles that are becoming a gas, vaporizing in other words, is equal to the number of particles that are becoming a liquid or condensing. In any sealed container, this will happen. The vapor pressure that's exerted 
when you reach dynamic equilibrium between gas and liquid is called the equilibrium vapor pressure. Now sometimes this is shortened and when scientists are talking about this to each other they just say vapor pressure rather than throwing the word equilibrium in there that's assumed. So let's think about how equilibrium vapor pressure is related to intermolecular forces. If you think about what has to happen in order for evaporation to occur, the intermolecular forces have to be broken up. So it makes sense that particles that are held together with strong intermolecular forces would be less likely to leave the liquid phase and become a gas. And things with low IMFs would be more likely to become a gas. And so you'd think that the stronger the IMFs, the lower the vapor pressure would be. And in fact, it turns out to be exactly correct. Here we've got three barometers, except they're not barometers because they're not empty in the top. If they had a vacuum, they would be at 760 torr at normal atmospheric pressure. But since the headspace in this first one is filled with water vapor, the water actually evaporates and creates this equilibrium vapor pressure. The new measurement is not 760, but 736, which indicates that the water is able to push down with 24 torrs of pressure. Compare, compare that to ethanol, C2H5OH. This does hydrogen bonding, but it doesn't do it as strongly as water. So the vapor pressure is higher, 65 torr, and it's able to push that liquid column down to 695. C2H5-2O is diethyl ether. So this is the basic structural formula. Now this is a dipole-dipole interaction, but it doesn't do hydrogen bonding. So its intermolecular forces are weaker, and, not surprisingly, it builds up a bigger vapor pressure. More of these particles are in the gas phase, fewer of them stick in the liquid phase. That drives the pressure all the way down to 215, and so the difference between 760 and that, 545 torrs, that's the equilibrium vapor pressure of that substance. So the rule is, equilibrium vapor pressure gets higher when the substances have lower IMFs, if they're at the same temperature. So looking at this graph, we can see the three substances' vapor pressures graphed against temperature. We're not concerned about temperature right now, so let's just pick any temperature and draw a line, like at about 20-something degrees C. The lowest vapor pressure we see is the first curve we cross, and that's water. The next one is ethanol, and the highest vapor pressure at any given temperature is diethyl ether. Looking at that same graph again, you might ask a different question. How, in fact, does temperature relate to vapor pressure? Well, we can see that as temperature goes up, in all cases for all of these three liquids, the vapor pressure goes up. And that's true for all liquids. The higher the temperature, the higher the equilibrium vapor pressure. However, it's not a linear relationship. It's a little more complicated than that mathematically. So in a later video, we're going to find out what to do about that. Another question you might ask yourself is, how does the amount of liquid relate to the vapor pressure? If you think about it for a little bit, the number of particles leaving and entering the gas phase should be independent of how much liquid is there. The pressure is going to build up to a certain amount, but if the liquid level is high, like it's up to here, you'll have fewer particles up here, but they'll reach the same equilibrium vapor pressure before the evaporation rate and the condensation rate match. So a large amount of liquid or a small amount of liquid doesn't really matter because it's about pressure, not about total number of particles that are in this headspace. Now, of course, there has to be at least some liquid in the flask in order for us to maintain the equilibrium vapor pressure. Another question is, how does the volume of the container relate to the vapor pressure? Well, this is a very similar analysis to the last question that we asked. If I have this liquid all packed into a container that, whose lid is right here, I'm still going to reach the same equilibrium vapor pressure. When the pressure gets so high, when it gets so crowded up in the headspace essentially, particles are going to start dive bombing back into the liquid phase at the same rate that they're evaporating. So it's independent of the size of the container. And another question you could ask yourself is how does the surface area of the liquid relate to vapor pressure, in other words, the container shape. If instead of a flask that's rather tall and skinny, what if we had a container that was wide 
and short sealed up container and we've got our liquid level in here like that would it make any difference well we've all probably experienced that water and other liquids evaporate more quickly from a high surface area that's one of the things that's going on when we dry dishes we're taking the droplets of water and we're smearing them out over a big surface area so they evaporate really readily we're also absorbing them into the fabric too but the equilibrium vapor pressure that's reached shouldn't really depend on how big the surface area is. You may have more particles up there, but not per unit volume. And they may get there faster, but they won't reach a higher equilibrium vapor pressure. That's going to be dependent on how strong the intermolecular forces are and what the temperature is. So equilibrium vapor pressure is independent of the volume of the liquid, the volume of the container, or the shape of the container or its surface area. Next time we're going to take a closer look at equilibrium vapor pressure and the particular relationship between temperature and equilibrium vapor pressure. And we're also going to look at how energy interplays with other phase changes like melting and freezing.